Several weeks ago, we looked at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Today, we look at the very end of Jesus' ministry. This is where Jesus enters the final week of his ministry. So all of that time of fasting and prayer, all of that time of preparation was leading to this final week that he would have the strength to endure. And just as we were called to journey with Jesus in the wilderness, so the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, that if we are to be his disciple, we must take up our cross and follow him. As Paul says, we must be crucified with Christ. And that's why each week, even this morning, we read from Philippians chapter 3, whatever gains... Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. And here's the important part, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. See, according to Scripture, and this is a consistent theme throughout the New Testament, that if we are going to participate, if we are going to share in Jesus' resurrection, if we are going to share in his glory, then we must also be willing, be prepared to share in his suffering and in his death. So before we are ready to celebrate Easter next week, we must be willing to follow Jesus to the cross. There is no resurrection without crucifixion. So our journeying with Jesus leads us here today to uh, the day known as Palm Sunday, the Sunday before the crucifixion. And before we begin, let us offer just one more word of prayer. Father God, be with us. We invoke the power of your Holy Spirit that it would be your words that we would hear this morning, and that all things would be done to the praise and glory of your name, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. So I invite you to follow along with me in Matthew chapter 21. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, I'll be putting the verses on the screen. We begin Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. In the very beginning of the story, it says, They approached Jerusalem from Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. And you see, this approach to Jerusalem is very significant in the gospel narrative. You know how when you're watching a movie that you can tell, regardless of checking your watch, regardless of knowing how long the movie is, you know when a movie is almost over because the narrative is kind of coming to a climax, right? The hero and the villain are finally having their showdown, right? So you're beginning the third act, you're beginning the conclusion of the story. And if you've been reading Matthew's Gospel, you will know that when he says, they approached Jerusalem, that we're coming to the end of the story. And why? Because in Matthew chapter 16, which is about halfway through the Gospel, Jesus says this. He says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. This prediction is repeated again and again by Jesus, so that we, the reader, know that when Jesus gets to Jerusalem, we're approaching the end of the story. And why Jerusalem? Jerusalem is the center of power, both political and religious. Jerusalem is the capital city, right? So as you know, the temple is in Jerusalem, so the priests live there and all of the religious elites of the day are there in Jerusalem. And not only that, but so-called King Herod is in Jerusalem, the kind of proxy Jewish ruler living under Roman occupation. Okay? So Jerusalem is the center of power, both political and religious. So it's no surprise that this is where the final conflict takes place. Think, for example, of August 
1963. August 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. delivers the famous I Have a Dream speech in the great March on Washington. Why is it a march on Washington? Why not a march on Atlanta or a march on Huntsville or a march on New York? It's a march on Washington. We know, it's obvious, because Washington is the center of power. So this is where you go. This is where the story leads. So you see, Jesus spent his ministry wandering the northern territory of Galilee. This is the rural area. So Jesus is going around to little fishing villages and little towns. But every time he opens his mouth, he's talking about the arrival of a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. But you see, it's one thing to be talking about a new kingdom when you're visiting little villages and fishing towns in Galilee. But to go to the capital city, to go to the center of power and be talking about a new kingdom, the kingdom of God, then you're going to be seen as a threat. Because that's where the people who currently hold power reside. And if you're talking about new power, then you're a threat to them. And you see, this tension between Jesus and Jerusalem in Matthew's Gospel has been there from the very beginning. From the very birth story of Jesus, Herod in Jerusalem hears, you know the story, he hears that there's a new king going to be born. So what does he do from Jerusalem? He orders all the young boys in the city of Bethlehem to be killed. Why? Because he is threatened by Jesus, even as an infant. So this tension between Jesus and Jerusalem, between these two competing powers, is a theme throughout the story. Now, Jesus was not the first or the only prophet to come around talking about the kingdom of God. Both before and after Jesus, there were many would-be messiahs, many self-proclaimed messiahs, who promised to liberate God's people from their enemies. So Rome, the occupying forces of the day, the empire of the day, kept a close eye on people like Jesus. Especially, and this is important to note, especially during the time of Passover. And why? Because Passover was an annual festival in which all of the Jews, no matter where they lived in the world, were expected to come here to Jerusalem. Millions of people coming to this city. And as we all know, the more people you get together, the more likely something bad is going to happen, right? So if you're an occupying empire, the last thing you want to see is for a lot of the people that you are oppressing to get together, because that's when bad things happen. So. Tensions are high during Passover in the capital city. So when Jesus does finally enter Jerusalem for the Passover feast, the question is, what's he going to do? And this is where we see next, the Bible says, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her, Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now, what do you notice here? What stands out to me as we think about this story is, does it seem like Jesus has a plan, or is this an accident? Has Jesus put some thought into his entrance into the city? You see, this was, this, was no, this was no accident. This was a coordinated effort. Now, again, I can't help but think of an analogy with the civil rights movement. Because we all know the story of Rosa Parks, who refuses to give up her seat on the bus. But at least for me, I think the way the story is usually told is we think that, oh, after a long day of work, she was sitting down and said, you know what, 
Today's the day. I'm not going to get up. What we don't realize is that what Rosa Parks did that day was no accident. That was a coordinated and well-planned point of action and of protest. Ms. Parks was prepared to enter into that conflict. She knew what she was getting into. And similarly with Jesus, he's not just strolling into Jerusalem with his friends. This is a coordinated and intentional demonstration. And I use that language very specifically. This is a public demonstration that Jesus is orchestrating. Jesus is going out of his way to get a donkey and a colt so that he can ride into the city on these animals. And why? What's significant about that? Matthew tells us, This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The prophet that Matthew is quoting here is Zechariah. Zechariah, who writes in the ninth chapter of his book, Let's go back and read the original context. This is what Zechariah writes. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. But you see, then the prophet continues, and this is where we get some context in terms of what does this prophecy really mean? What is Jesus fulfilling by bringing these animals? The prophet says, I will take away the chariots of Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He, that is this new king, will proclaim peace to the nations, and his rule will extend from sea to sea. You see, the prophet Zechariah is saying that the king that will come on a donkey and a colt He's using that as a juxtaposition, as a comparison with the chariots and war horses. By entering on a donkey instead of a chariot, by entering on a colt instead of a war horse, Jesus is showing exactly what kind of kingdom this new kingdom is. You see, the donkey and the colt are an intentional form of mockery of military power. Remember, we read at the beginning that the Bible says that Jesus is entering Jerusalem from Bethphage. I don't expect any of you to know where that is, but what's important for you to know is that Jesus is entering into Jerusalem from the east. Why is that significant? Well, what we can surmise is that most likely at this very same time, the Roman governor Pilate would have been entering Jerusalem from the west. So on the other side of town, on this very day, entering Jerusalem for the Passover feast, would have been a different ruler representing a different kingdom with a different sort of procession. See, Pilate is coming from the west because that's where his palace is, in the coastal region of the Mediterranean, in Caesarea. So Pilate comes into the city, and again, why is Pilate coming? To keep an eye on these people, to make sure that everyone keeps in line, to keep order in the city. So Pilate enters from the west, and how do you suppose Pilate enters the city? but with chariots and soldiers and horses. So for Jesus, and this is what you just have to catch here, because this is what the readers would have understood about the significance of this, the irony, the intentional irony of what Jesus is doing. For Jesus to enter the city at this time on his donkey is poking his finger right into the eye of the Roman Empire. I was trying to think of an analogy of what, what this would be like to sort of bring the point home. Uh, and I was thinking about, well, what would, be, what would be a place that would be really sort of intimidating, right? And you think about like a, a Harley-Davidson biker rally, right? 
all these tough guys with bandanas and sunglasses and beards that are much bigger than mine. And imagine if you show up to this kind of biker rally on some kind of scooter or a moped, right? How is that going to be taken by them? It's, it's an insult. It's a mockery, right? And that's what Jesus is doing. By entering the city with all of this fanfare, if you don't get the joke, you're missing the point. You see, kings don't come on donkeys. And no one living at the time would have missed the joke. Jesus is making a mockery of the empire and their military power. Pilate thinks he's tough. Pilate thinks that his power comes from soldiers. But the prophet Zechariah tells us, and Jesus shows us, that the kingdom of God is a different sort of kingdom. And the proud and powerful Roman Empire will be no match for the humble and peaceful Jesus. So by enacting this kind of <clears throat> demonstration, this mockery of imperial power, Jesus is making visible the option that is in front of each one of us. Which procession will you be a part of? To which kingdom will you belong? The story continues. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! You see, the shouts of the people are shouts of messianic hope. Roman occupation in Judea had been going on for about 150 years at this point. And ever since that time, the people have got, of God had been waiting and hoping for deliverance. So that's why they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. It means deliverance, freedom. The one they were waiting for is the son of David. And why the son of David? Because here is the one who will restore the glory of ancient Israel. And think, if you will, how would the Roman Empire feel about these shouts of Hosanna, these shouts of freedom? How does Rome feel about this son of David? To have this kind of demonstration... In Jerusalem, during Passover, is one of the most dangerous and rebellious acts that you could imagine. The scene is a revolutionary one, and not a single person would have missed that. So those that enter into this procession are, in a very real sense, risking their lives along with Jesus. And so I know that up to this point we've been discussing a lot of history, a lot of context that may or may not have been interesting to you, but now we come to the point. This is the point that makes a difference for you and for me. Because the Bible says when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. And we know why they were stirred. We know what sort of demonstration this was. The whole city was stirred, and they asked, Who is this? And I want to end things right there with that question. Who is this? This is the very question that we must answer for ourselves today. We said at the outset that we're here to journey with Jesus, to participate in this story, to take up our cross and go be crucified with Christ. So, when we read this story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, we must ask ourselves, who is this? Are we willing to enter into this procession? Are we willing to hail Jesus as our Lord and King and Messiah? And I so appreciate the children's story that was told this morning because, you see, this is not something that can be taken lightly. 
It's easy to do it today, but don't think of this as an easy decision, something minor. After all, this happens on a Sunday. Jesus is arrested that Thursday and crucified on Friday. So the question that is being put to you is, will you be faithful to Jesus even to death? Or will you be like these crowds who in the moment of decision turn against him and say, we have no king but Caesar? If we are going to be crucified with Christ, we have to realize that crucifixion is no accident. Jesus doesn't get crucified by chance. But it's because of things like this. It's because he was stepping out and acting. To follow Jesus is not simply to float along through life, but requires from you a decision, a commitment. You know, we talk a lot of times in this church, in this denomination, about the last days and about persecution. And what always shocks me about that is that this is by no means a church worth persecuting. Think about that. What are we doing worth being martyred for, right? We've looked at this story and how Jesus is perceived as a threat to the powers that be. Are we any kind of threat to anybody? Are we disturbing any peace whatsoever? I don't think so. But you see, the juxtaposition between Jesus and Rome is just as relevant today as it was then. And the same question posed to them is posed to us. Where do your loyalties lie? To whom do you pledge allegiance? Are you loyal to yourself and to your own kingdom? Are you loyal to the powers that be? I mean, I think this kind of question is especially relevant today. In the news this week, the United States is entering a another theater of conflict. And we as Christians have to ask ourselves, what is our response to this kind of thing going to be? What sort of people are we? To whom do we owe our allegiance? To whose kingdom do we belong? Are you going to put trust into your own kingdom, into your own power? Or are you able to put your trust into the humble and peaceful king? Every day, every decision that we make, every conversation that we have, every Facebook post that we make, as small and petty as all of these things are, every decision we make is an opportunity to answer this question, who is Jesus? Are you a person of peace or a person of conflict? Are you a person of humility or a person of pride? Do you seek power or do you seek to be a servant? To put it very simply, the way Jesus put it, are you seeking to hang on to your life or are you willing to let it go for the sake of God's kingdom? So long as we continue to go with the flow and pursue comfort and ease, we'll never be in step with Jesus. And so I'm speaking to myself as much as I am to any of you. What are we doing, both as individuals and as a church? What are we doing to step out? What are we doing to go out of our way to make a decision for love, to be intentional, to lay aside our own interests and to offer ourselves in selfless love. So as the deacons come forward, I know you guys are ready, the deacons can come forward to collect the offering, and I just invite you, as they do so, to spend a moment reflecting on this question. Who is Jesus to you? And this is not just a question of your mind or your even your heart, but who is Jesus to you is a question that you answer with the whole purpose and direction of your life. So think about that today as we pray. Father God, give us the strength to enter into the procession of your Son. When we are tempted to pursue the interests of our own kingdom, show us the way of your kingdom. 
When we are tempted to enter into conflict with others, show us the way of peace. When we are tempted by our own vanity and pride, show us the way of humility. God, we surrender ourselves to you, everything we are and everything we have, as living sacrifices. So in all things, by the power of the Holy Spirit, conform us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.